Susanna Porter. I'm an editor in uh, the Random House uh, division in the Ballantine Books division. And I just want to thank you all for coming. Sorry to repeat this, but so early. <laughs> there were like no people up the subway this morning. I have not been up this early in a long time. Um, but I'm pleased to be here this morning. It was worth getting up early to introduce my one of my favorite authors, uh, Paula McLean. Um, Paula's uh, beloved runaway bestseller, The Paris Wife, which now has 1.5 million copies in print swept us all away to Paris, where we got to spend time with Hemingway, Gertrude Stein, and F. Scott Fitzgerald, and where Paula brought to life a devastating love story. Now, in her new novel, Circling the Sun, Paula takes us to exotic 1920s Kenya, where a glamorous circle of British expats are living dramatic and pioneering lives, a time and place where love triangles are quite the norm. The amazing woman at the center of Paula's spellbinding novel is Beryl Markham. And if you don't already know who she is and what she's famous for, I guarantee you'll become kind of obsessed with her, as I did, after you hear Paula this morning tell you about her, and then after reading this wonderful novel. Jodi Picot loved this book, and she summed it up really well. Paula McLean cements herself as the writer of historical fiction, memoir, with, with Circling the Sun giving vivid voice to Beryl Markham, a singular, extraordinary woman whose name we all know and whose story we don't yet know. And just let me add that we've had three pre-pub reviews so far for Circling the Sun, Library Journal, Booklist, and Kirkus. They're all raves and they're all starred. Yeah. <laughs> 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 We didn't tell her, we, you know, we're too busy. Um, Paula's a gifted storyteller. She's insatiably curious as she approaches her subjects with a close focus and a nuanced eye. She has an amazing ability to breathe life into her characters. And let me mention what a thrill it's been to be on the, in the front row seat uh, for this book. When I acquired The Paris Wife, uh, it was in a heated auction. The book was more or less finished. I got a chance to kind of tinker with it a tiny bit, but it was a, it was a, it was a finished work. Um, this book I've watched grow um, and enrich and as the months have gone on and it's been such a thrill to see Paula really at work. I, I just, it just makes me in awe. Um, so we're really excited about the publication of Circling the Sun uh, coming up in late July. Um, I can't wait for you to share this book with your readers and with your communities. And so with that being said, I want to welcome Paula. Good morning. <clears throat> So four flights of mine were canceled yesterday as these freakish, maybe half imaginary storms tried to keep me out of the sky and I was not having any of that. And I think Beryl Markham would be a little proud, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let me just start by saying that I have nothing but love for librarians. Your tireless championing of the Paris Wife helped make it a book club darling. And to that, I'm eternally indebted to you. But you know what? I'm, I've actually always been indebted to librarians. I don't know if you know this. I grew up in foster care in California, so basically spending 14 years bouncing through the California foster care system, which is a really difficult way to grow up. And by the time I reached second grade, I could not bear making friends only to lose them again. So I decided, judiciously, I think, that I would only be friends with librarians. <laughs> and so I ate my lunch in the library and developed relationships, even in second grade. So my librarians always knew what I loved. Um, and I read everything. I read voraciously, obsessively, sometimes alphabetically, <laughs> um, as if my life was at stake, which I think, in a way, it was. And it's sort of a cliche that we say books save us but sometimes it's true. It's a cliche to say that we read for escape, and yet we often do. And I realize now that I was doing more than just escaping. I was actually reaching, do you know what I mean? I was stretching, I was learning to think, I was learning to hope, I was imagining worlds I might want to inhabit or maybe someday build, and I was in school to become the writer that I am today, the very particular kind of writer, actually. And I've been at this a long time. It doesn't seem like that sometimes. I had a very schizophrenic publishing career. I started out as a poet, so I have collections of poetry. I have a memoir about growing up in foster care. I have contemporary fiction. But it wasn't until I started doing research 
and connecting to history and a particular voice in history with Hadley Richardson that I really felt like I was tapping all of my particular gifts, certainly my empathy, but also my curiosity. I mean, something very special happened to me when I found Hadley in the pages of Hemingway's Immovable Feast. Seriously, seriously, I had no idea what was coming down the pike at me. I mean, changing my life, obviously, but that's just one thing. But it really changed who I am as a writer and it was so special and so profound for me, the way that I reached through time and space to connect with this woman who actually lived, right? And to learn about her world. What did I know about Paris in any time, you know? I lived in Cleveland, Ohio. I wrote this book in a Starbucks near my house, which is about as far away from a Parisian cafe as you can actually <laughs> physically, humanly get. But I was in a time machine every day, climbed into my time machine, and disappeared and it was delicious and it was the most fun I'd ever had. And it kind of ruined me because I was just sure it could never possibly happen again. And then, because life is very good, it did. So about two years ago, when I was in the middle of a you know, creative crisis, trying to figure out what I was gonna do for a follow-up, not so easy, um, I picked up Beryl Markham's memoir, West with the Night. And sort of like Hadley, I had never heard Hadley Richardson's name. I'm pretty sure I had never heard Beryl Markham's name before somebody handed me this book. And within, it wasn't even two paragraphs. I just knew. I didn't know who she was, but I knew I was going to write about her. And it was something in the quality of her voice. It just, it was about as subtle as being struck by lightning. And that was it. And I never looked back. Um, when things don't work as a writer, <laughs> you're never more miserable, am I right? It's like being kicked out of heaven, like kind of every day. But when things do work, it's perfect. It's, it's magic. And something happened to me when I connected to Beryl and learned about her story. If you don't know Beryl's um, historical significance, she was the first woman to cross the Atlantic solo, east to west the hard way in 1936. Um, she wrote about that and her other amazing kind of daring hijinks in this memoir, West of the Night. West of the Night, do you guys know this book? You should know it, it's so good, it's so good, it's so good. Um, but what I really connected to with Beryl was her African childhood and her incredibly dramatic personal story, which she barely even gives us glimpses of in West with the Night. So if you read West with the Night, you would never guess, for instance, that when Beryl was four years old, she was abandoned by her mother, who returned to England, and, and forced to reinvent herself as this young warrior in training with the Kipsigis tribe on her father's land. You would never guess that her father, who was the great love of her life, would also abandon her like her mother did and, and uh, betray her. You would never guess that for 10 years she was involved in a totally complex and juicy love triangle with the safari hunter Dennis Finch Hatton and with Karen Blixen, another of history's unforgettable women. Now, Karen and Dennis's story is writ large for all of time in Out of Africa, which she wrote under the pen name Isak Dinsen. Beryl doesn't turn up in that book, even though she was incredibly enmeshed with these people for years and years and years. And Karen never turns up in Beryl's book. <laughs> interesting, interesting. But it's just that kind of discovery that totally magnetizes me as a writer that says in no uncertain terms, this is where the story is and this is where it's gonna get really fun. So as I was researching Beryl, one of the things that really occurred to me about her, and I think it's because of who I am and my background too, was that here is a woman who made herself, who organized herself around these incredible losses in her early life, and that her fearlessness, or what we see as her fearlessness, all the things that she tackled. So over and over again, it wasn't just the flight, over and over again, she accomplished these things that women of her age didn't dare even try. So at 18, she became the first licensed racehorse trainer in the world. 
She became one of the first people to hold a commercial pilot's license anywhere in the world. She was the first person to successfully scout big game from the air for safari hunters. And in 1936, as I said, she flew the Atlantic east to west, not at 30,000 feet where I tried to fly last night, you know, in our little bubble, um, but at 2,000 feet above these icy waves, no radio contact, trusting her instincts and her instruments. She was a badass. <laughs> this woman <laughs> was a badass, really one of the most extraordinary iconoclastic women who ever lived. And I think one of the reasons I was able to connect to her story is because we share these, we share these little bits of DNA, emotional DNA, right? It's kind of freaky. It's kind of freaky that Beryl was four years old when her mother abandoned her, and I was four years old when my mother abandoned me. And Beryl's mother came back when she was 20 and made things really complicated, and my mother came back when I was 20. And that's like not even hitting the tip of the iceberg. She met Hemingway on safari in 1936, and he said she wrote a bloody wonderful book, which she absolutely did, and he also called her a gold-plated bitch, which <laughs> perhaps she was. <laughs> perhaps she was. Earlier this year, I was able to actually travel to Kenya and experience some of the places that Beryl loved and meant so much to her, and some of the people that she knew, which is kind of extraordinary that these people still exist. She died in Nairobi in 1986, but people, I'm telling you, she is still there. I was able to go to the shadowy ballroom of the Mufega Club, to the Ingong race, horses, race course where she ran her beloved thoroughbreds, to the Wilson Aerodrome, which has been there since like 1906, where she learned to fly in 1929. I had a great conversation one afternoon with this guy called Buster Parnell, who was her jockey for 20 years, and he's still alive. He's like a bajillion. He's like Methuselah, <laughs> right? And he sat there like in a lawn chair at the race course, like this piece of polished mahogany. And he does a great barrel impression, too. And he told me all these stories, and he told me that she was the great unconsummated love of his life. And he kept stopping himself and saying, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to put it. There was nobody like her who ever lived and there never will be again. And that's exactly how I feel about her too. So people, if you are half as captivated and inspired and magnetized by Beryl as I am, this is gonna be really fun. Thank you so much.